This episode of Real Engineering is brought to you by Skillshare, home to 15,000 classes that could teach you a new life skill. The first 400 people to sign up using the link in the description will get a two month free trial. World War I was a static, grueling war. Weapon technology had advanced quickly, but the technology to carry these weapons lagged behind, resulting in bloody face-offs between entrenched armies. No battle embodies this ghastly form of war more than the Battle of Verdun on the Meuse River, which was the longest battle of World War I, lasting 300 days with over 1 million casualties. A stalemate where territory was won with the lives of the men brave enough to push forward into the storm of bullets and explosive shells raining from all directions. 26 years later, the Germans crossed this same river in a single day, empowered by immense improvements in motorised vehicles, most notably the tank. The Germans created a new form of warfare where battles were fought and won before the victim even understood what was happening. With these machines in your arsenal, trench warfare was obsolete. War was no longer two dimensional. In one moment you were ducking for cover, anticipating an explosion as the whir of swarming dive bombers filled your ears. The next you are facing a wall of armoured vehicles. This of course was the infamous Blitzkrieg which Germany employed to take over the majority of Europe with eerie efficiency. Europe would get its first taste of this lightning war on September 1st 1939 when 1.5 million German troops invaded Poland. The German invasion of Poland was a battle of epic disproportions. The Luftwaffe flew ahead armed with Junker 87 Stuka dive bombers which were fitted with horrifying sirens which were simply high revving propellers fitted to the landing gear of the plane. They were designed to cause mass panic and fear among civilians and enemy troops alike. They destroyed strategic positions and caused civilians to flee and interfere with supply lines, softening the border defences before the German armoured divisions broke through like a spear point through inadequate armour, followed by motorised German infantry who formed a supply column, reinforcing the front line with fuel and ammunition, never stopping to celebrate, always pushing forward and keeping the pressure on. Any troops that did not retreat fast enough were encircled and decimated. This pattern was repeated and in a single week German troops advanced 225 kilometers onto Warsaw's doorstep, despite Poland mobilizing 1 million men to fight back. One famous battle on this first day of war, often mistold, involved a valiant cavalry rush of the Polish army on the German infantry dispersing them and delaying their advancement long enough to allow the Polish 1st Rifle Battalion to retreat. Only then German tanks appeared and fired upon them, forcing the Horst units to retreat. German propaganda announced the stupidity of Polish commanders sending cavalry armed with sabres and lances against armoured vehicles when in reality they were armed with anti-tank rifles, which were capable of penetrating 15mm of armour at 300 metres at 30 degrees. The Panzer 1 and 2 used in this battle were vulnerable to this weapon. On September 28th, four weeks after the first shot was fired, the Polish capital surrendered to the relentless German siege while Russia took the east. This proved the effectiveness of the Blitzkrieg and sent shockwaves through Europe. On May 10th, 1940, Germany launched an invasion of the Low Countries of Holland, Belgium and Luxembourg. Luxembourg with just 400 infantry and 12 cavalry fell in a single day. Belgium's defence centred around the Iban Amal fort with 1,200 men also fell on a single day. This fortress was one of the strongest in the world but was created with 2D strategic manoeuvres in mind. It took about 500 German special forces landing with gliders to disable Ibn Amal's major defences. They removed explosive charges from nearby bridges, ensuring a clear route for German reinforcements. Others landed inside the fort planting their own explosive charges and throwing grenades into bunkers and destroying artillery. Where they couldn't overcome defenders, they called for airstrikes from Stuka dive bombers. Holland, despite having advanced warning of the imminent invasion, were caught off guard by merciless bombing of their cities by the Luftwaffe, followed by the deployment of the 7th and 22nd Airborne Divisions. Germany now had a direct northern route into France. The Allies were prepared for this threat and focused their best troops on the northern border leaving the heavily fortified border between Germany and France relatively low manned. The invasion of the Low Countries was not intended as an invasion route, it was a diversion and on May 12th the spearhead of the German Blitzkrieg broke through what was once called the impenetrable defence of the rough mountainous and heavily wooded area of the Ardennes. Quickly enveloping and trapping the 400,000 Allied troops stationed to defend the assumed invasion from the north, culminating in the Battle of Dunkirk where thousands of civilian ships sailed from Britain to save stranded soldiers. 
A month later, on June 22nd, France surrendered to Germany. The French were simply not prepared for the speed and ferocity of this type of warfare, despite having tanks more than capable of taking on the German panzers in one-on-one -on -one battle. For example, the French S-35 was arguably the best tank at the outbreak of the war. It had good balance between armour, mobility and firepower. It was more than capable of taking on the Panzer 1s and 2s that formed the brunt of the armoured divisions, and its forward-facing armour could even withstand direct hits from the German heavy tank, the Panzer IV. Where the S-35 failed was its lack of numbers with only 440 built. Had the French been prepared and built enough tanks, they could have defeated the German invasion. The Germans were more than aware of this outclassing of their tanks and led them into pushing further to create larger tanks with thicker and thicker armour and larger and larger guns. They pushed the boundaries and experimented with gigantic tanks like the Panzer VIII, which still, to this day, is the heaviest fully enclosed armoured fighting vehicle ever built. Real Life Lord just uploaded a video about the crazy designs of tanks the Germans came up with. Here he is to tell you a little more about them. The Panzer VIII Maus weighed 188 tons, over three times heavier than a Tiger I tank. Its 128mm main gun was enough to destroy all Allied armored vehicles then in service at ranges exceeding 3,500 meters. Only two were ever built near the end of the war, but the Germans had far more ambitious plans than even the Maus tank. The Landkreuzer P1000 Rata was a super tank designed in 1942 that was planned on weighing 1,000 tons. This behemoth would have been armed with naval artillery and be equipped with 25 centimeters of hardened steel armor. It would have had a crew of over 40 men operating it had it ever been built, but as with most insane Nazi engineering ideas, the Landkreuzer remained a blueprint for the entirety of the war. This wild experimentation could have been their downfall. Constant iterations and improved technology kept production costs and time high. Ultimately, Germany had some of the most advanced tanks, but too few to take on what was to come, because the Russians were busy building a staggering secret army of T-34s. This haunting recording of Hitler's normal speaking voice captures his shock at the sheer number of tanks encountered on the Eastern Front. When Nemo said that a state with 35,000 tanks on the Eden Kamm, he said they were dead. 35,000 tanks. Wir haben, über, wir haben zur Zeit über 34.000 Panzer vernichtet. Wenn mir das jemand gesagt hätte, ich hätte gesagt, wenn mir ein General von mir erklärt hätte, dass hier im Staat 35.000 Panzer in dieser Ziel der sie, sie sehen äh, alles doppelt oder zehnfach. Das ist da, sie sehen Gespenster. Das haben wir nicht für möglich. At this stage, Hitler knew the might of the German Blitzkrieg had met its match. Germany had focused so much of their time trying to create the perfect war machine, while Russia saw how to beat the Blitzkrieg, in sheer numbers, determination, armour and firepower. Russia could build enormous amounts of the T-34, partially because of the insanely huge factories, but also because of the Russian ethos of quantity over quality. Russian tanks were crudely constructed, welding was poor and armour plates rarely fit together a flaw which the Japanese exploited by throwing Molotov cocktails at the tanks, which then dripped flaming fuel onto the crew. The pins that held the track of the T-34 were not held in place either. Most tanks had some form of locking mechanism that kept the pin in place, but the T-34 pins were free to float. To prevent them from falling out, the T-34 simply had a hard stop in the path of the track that hammered the pins back into place as they passed by. A crude yet effective measure to keep the manufacturing time and cost down. This crude construction did not stop this tank from being a formidable opponent. In fact, the T-34 is one of the standout tanks of World War II. It had heavily sloped armour, which both helped deflect projectiles, but also increased the effective thickness of the armour, thanks to a bit of trigonometry. If we take the 47mm thick front hull armour of the T-34, its armour is simply 47mm thick when vertical, but if we begin to tilt it, its effective thickness equals the original thickness divided by the sine of the tilt angle. The front hull armour had a slope of 60 degrees, making its effective thickness 94mm, double its actual thickness. This combined with the enormous gun allowed the T-34 to take on any tank on the battlefield. By the end of the war, 8 out of 10 German soldiers died fighting on the Eastern Front. One of the standout battles on the Eastern Front, if not in the history of mankind, was the Battle of Kursk. While D-Day, Stalingrad, the Battle of the Bulge and the Battle of Britain are hailed as the great turning points of the war, as they should, they all pale in magnitude to the Battle of Kursk. This battle epitomises the resilience of the Russian people. 
Kursk sat in the middle of a bulge on the Eastern Front, a bulge that needed to be eliminated to prevent Russia from mounting a counter-offensive on the Germans' rear. The strategic importance of this battle was known to both sides. Hitler had told Heinz Guderian, the mastermind of the German Blitzkrieg, that the thought of the battle made him sick to his stomach every time he thought about it. Russia had dug deep in Kursk. Every single citizen was involved in the war effort, with near 5,000 kilometers of trenches circling the city, half a million each of anti-tank and anti-personnel mines, with obstacles torn with barbed wire. And this was just their passive defense. Russia had amassed 1.3 million soldiers, 20,000 artillery pieces, 3,600 tanks, and 2,600 aircraft. This was Russia's last stand. Hitler ordered 900,000 soldiers to the region, drawing men away from the Western Front as the Allies were not expected to attack anytime soon, along with 10,000 artillery guns, 2,700 tanks and 2,000 aircraft. This was one third of Germany's remaining military strength, concentrated in a single area. What led was the largest tank battle in history and a battle that ultimately blunted the spearhead of the German Blitzkrieg. Day after day, Germany attempted to break through the Russian defence, only to be repelled time after time. The Luftwaffe was prevented from gaining air superiority by the Russian Air Force, while German tanks were crippled by the combined onslaught of anti-tank mines, infantry artillery fire and the never-ending barrage of T-34s. All the while partisan citizens to the rear disrupted the already dodgy supply lines feeding the German front. This was the last step forward the Nazis took. Russia had endured the storm. Germany would be on the back foot for the rest of the war, and the race towards Berlin between the Allies and the Soviets was on. Many of you ask me what software I use to animate these videos and how I learned. I use a program called Adobe After Effects and taught myself how to use it by watching videos online. These days you can teach yourself pretty much any skill online and Skillshare is a fantastic place to do it, with professional and understandable classes that follow a clear learning curve. Skillshare is an online learning community for creators with more than 15,000 classes in graphic design, animation, web development, photography, video game design and more. A premium membership begins around $10 a month for unlimited access to all courses, but the first 400 people to sign up with this link will get a two month free trial. In those two months, you could easily learn the skills you need to start a new hobby or business, just like I did with this channel. So ask yourself right now, what skill have you been putting off learning? What project have you been dreaming of completing, but you aren't sure if you have the skills to do it? Why not start right now and sign up to Skillshare using the link below? You've nothing to lose and a valuable life skill to gain. As usual, if you want to follow me on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, or listen to my new podcast with Sam from Wendover Productions, the links are in the description. I'd also like to thank my Patreon supporters. You may have noticed a significant leap in animation quality this week, and that's thanks to Patreon and Mike from Mobox Graphics. Mike is an engineer like me, and a far superior animator. All of your pledges go to employing Mike. If we can raise enough on Patreon, we may even be able to get Mike working on Real Engineering full time to bring you more videos every month. Thanks for watching and see you in two weeks for the next episode of Real Engineering.